then and we start, oh, there we go. I start talking and there was a big group of people coming. All right, so uh, Jörg Schumacher will be talking about self-aggregation of moist convection in a conditional and unstable environment. Okay, Jörg? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, first I want to thank uh, the organizers for this nice workshop. And as you will see in a minute, I'm not really an atmospheric scientist. I grew up in theoretical physics and then now I'm actually in a mechanical engineering department and I'm doing things which are hopefully a little bit related to atmospheric science. Um, so you, uh, the work I'm going to talk about is a joint work. Uh, my PhD student, Thomas Weidauer, he, is, uh, he has basically finished and is about to move to the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in, in Hamburg, joining Björn Stevens' group and doing some gigantic LES for the whole Germany. Then there's Jorge Bayon Kuba, who is now at the uh, Abu Dhabi Institute. And the work started together with Olivier almost five years ago. We met at the KITP in Santa Barbara for a program which was called the Physics of Climate Change. And <clears throat> so that's how we started and uh, continued ever since. And I'm basically giving you an overview uh, of our progress of the last five years of our joint efforts. So you might ask where Ilmenau is situated. It's actually a very small city. You can see it here in the Thuringian Woods. You draw a line from Frankfurt to Berlin, and then you cut it up at about the half, and then you are uh, exactly at the, in the area where I'm living and working right now. It's basically the center of mass of Germany. And this place is, has a very special focus, research focus, which is on uh, thermal convection in the mechanical engineering department. We are actually running the biggest laboratory <coughs> experiment of dry convection, which is existing in the, in the world. It's a huge barrel, seven meters in diameter, up to seven meters in height, in which we study convection in air. So you might ask, why do you need such a big barrel? Well, probably some of you know that the, uh, to understand the heat transport in such a system, it is essential to learn what is the physics in the boundary layers. And the boundary layers are extremely tiny for a seven meter high uh, barrel at a Rayleigh number of 10 to 12, which is not, by far not the largest that can be achieved in the laboratory. You have a one and a half centimeter thick boundary layer which you can these days access fully with um, measurement techniques. So, and in particular, my students, uh, we are contributing with direct numerical simulations of dry convection. This is a figure of the boundary layer structure uh, in a turbulent convection flow. And the two, uh, the two aspects which are related more to the topics which are discussed here is on the one hand, uh, we are going very close, we are going into the vicinity of the edge of a cloud, and we are really looking at the entrainment and the mixing properties right at this edge, which is done here by direct numerical simulations. And this is a joint work. Deepin Kuma is my postdoc working on that, together with Raymond Shaw and Holger Siebert. Holger, as you probably might know, some of you, is doing the helicopter based cloud uh, measurements. So I'm going to talk about um, another topic which is related, and that is basically more interested in the structure formation processes and how the structures are related to the transport properties uh, across such a cloud layer. So this is the topic I'm going to talk about. The outline is as follows. Um, we have a slightly different perspective uh, in which we are approaching the topic, and that is we are coming from the rayleigh Benard case, and we are basically, and I will discuss this in detail, extending the classical rayleigh Benard convection model, and will try uh, and will <laughs> and want to understand um, how this model works in terms of um, formation, structure formation, and transport. I will talk a little bit in the second part about the radiative cooling and additional effect which we included. And then we will look at um, the analysis of Lagrangian traces in such a 
system. And um, since the system is rather simple, uh, it's probably also a nice testing bed to, uh, for a systematic reduction of the degrees of freedom. So similar to the talk which was given by Wojciech, um, uh, I will be focused to the uh, shallow convection and the low clouds, just to put it into the big perspective. So we, uh, <coughs> our interest is uh, in mesoscale processes and in the organization of cloud patterns uh, in such regions. And the three questions which I formulate as a kind of motivation are as follows. What is the simplest system of flow equation that describes the formation of clouds starting from a classical rayleigh binar case? This is uh, related to the model development. And then uh, we are actually, we want to run direct numerical simulations. So we really want to um, avoid parametrizations of the turbulence. This keeps the model simple enough in terms of the number of parameters that can be varied and it allows us to conduct systematic studies. And actually, interestingly, these can be done in different uh, convective regimes. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, uh, is this an appropriate testing bed for systematic reductions of the degrees of freedom in such a system? So let me start with the equations. And this would be a set of Boussinesq equations uh, for shallow clouds. Um, we are not allowing for rain, so these are clouds without uh, rainfall. They are ice-free, and we are neglecting compressibility effects, which is um, uh, okay for low clouds, and that means we are sticking with the Boussinesq approximation, having an incompressible fluid. This is the mass balance. Here you see the momentum balance, the Navier-Stokes equations. I'm adding an, uh, a driving term, uh, F, to the right-hand side. We have the temperature, or, the or that what remains from the energy balance, with the latent heat release term and the radiative driving term. And we have um, <coughs> two advection diffusion equations for the vapor and the uh, liquid water content in the system. The F is, as you might guess, is exactly the buoyancy term, so which is basically the first two terms can be thought as something like a virtual temperature, uh, which are causing exactly these two contributions, and then there is a negative contribution coming from the liquid water content. Anything which is not covered by blue in this system would correspond to the classical dry rayleigh binar convection, which, uh, as I said before, we studied in this experimental, we study in this experimental device. So now we are doing a, a, a number of simplifications. Uh, this model can be simulated, and there are many people who are solving these equations of motion, for instance, Wojciech and his colleagues, but we are trying to, oops, we are trying to go one step further. So we are since there is no fallout of rain, we can basically summarize the uh, vapor content and the liquid water content to the total water content that uh, saves us one variable, as you can see here. For a moment, we are neglecting the radiation, but as I said, we are switching it on later. So now you are left basically with something which will turn out to be the buoyancy which is a function of the temperature or the entropy of the total water content and of the height. And that brings me to the next simplification step. One thing that is like worth pointing out is that the diffusion of it really doesn't apply to cloud droplets, am I right? So that's kind of a little bit of a... In some sense, yeah. They go out and but that's perhaps the minus point. Yes, that's why I, I also wrote something yeah. like, uh, yeah, uh, so you are completely right. This is, there is some simplification already in that part. So, okay, this is exactly what we are left with. Now I have substituted F vector by B, and that is pointing in, in the Z direction here only. 
uh, in our system. And what we are doing now is basically, so this is a plot which gives you the specific volume, um, the inverse of the mass density as a function of QT and of S. And um, you see that uh, indeed if you are remaining close to the phase boundary, this dashed uh, line, uh, you can approximate this by a piecewise uh, linear uh, equation of state. So you are basically having partial derivatives of these two state variables um, for, uh, for the buoyancy, and this gives you just constants, and as you might imagine, these numbers Bs, uh, U and Bss, they, are, they differ on both sides of the phase boundary, and that's exactly what you need. You need this discontinuity in order to get uh, latent heat release. So this, this idea is not new. There's actually a, a very nice series of papers from Chris Bretherton, who, in principle, uh, laid out these ideas uh, in the late 80s. What we have done, and which is described in detail in this paper, is we have extended uh, this model, and I'm going to show you in which way we have extended it later. So now, for convenience, we are just recombining S and QT, which are now <coughs> linear relations to new variables, which we are calling a dry and a moist buoyancy. And the next step is we need a we need an explicit saturation condition, um, which determines whether our air parcels are locally saturated or unsaturated. And since everything is linearized, this is actually uh, rather simple to do. Um, and it brings you basically to, these, uh, to, these, um, to such a consideration. Um, the partial derivatives are now either 0 or 1. And from, uh, from these two passes, you can conclude that this must be a linear relation. And then this linear, this additional term, uh, which arises here, uh, contains the adiabatic lapse rates. So, and that brings you to the following system of equations. Um, this is the classical Rayleigh-Binard case. So we have a layer heated from below, cooled from above. And when there's no fluid, there's, an, there's a linear temperature profile. That's the, uh, the equilibrium state for the dry convection system. We have the momentum, mass-momentum balance and we have the transport equation. This is the prime quantity which uh, describes the deviations about this equilibrium state. So this is now extended to the moist case. Then B, as a function now of D, M, and Z, is given by this uh, relation, so which describes either uh, if a parcel is saturated, M will contribute if a parcel is unsaturated, D minus NSZ will contribute. So there will be, uh, this is uh, continuous, but um, there will be different slopes when you are crossing the phase boundary. So now you have these two equations instead of the one, and you can now start to play around with the equilibrium states. And already there, you have a huge variety of possibilities, which arise simply due to the fact that you now have four values which you are prescribing at the bottom and at the top. And you can define something like a cloud base, uh, basically the, exactly the height z, where the equilibrium state switches from unsaturated to saturated. Um, <coughs> the dry buoyancy corresponds to something which is known as the liquid water potential temperature. The moist buoyancy corresponds to something which is basically the equivalent potential temperature. The liquid water mo content in our model is, uh, is simply the, the defect between these two terms that enter the saturation uh, condition and the cloud boundary, which is sketched here as an isosurface from a simulation. Is, uh, we are taking all the points that have QL exactly zero. This is... Um, um, Professor Barth showed the Paluch diagram in his talk, and this is basically a sketch how you can translate the Paluch uh, diagram, which many of you know, into our coordinate system. So then um, you have seen we have two 
scalar equations which are advected in the same flow. So then you can combine these two scalar equations um, and you can basically formulate everything in terms of a conserved passive scalar which is decaying. And physically this means that for any initial condition in which you have different states for D and M, you are going to a mixing line which is uh, this diagonal line in this uh, diagram with the time, both fields will become synchronized sooner or later. Uh, and um, <coughs> the only way to perturb this synchronization is when you are applying different additional driving for both scalar fields, which we are exactly going to do when we are introducing the radiation. Um, you can also, and that has also been done uh, in other groups, for instance, by Juan Pedro Meado in, in Hamburg at the MPE, you can even simplify further the system by uh, formulating everything in terms of a mixture fraction, and that is a familiar mechanism which is well known from turbulent combustion, and then you are basically expressing the buoyancy as a function of the mixture fraction, and uh, you, can, you can also study entrainment processes, mixing processes in such a setting. So the parameters of our model are the following ones. Well, in dry Rayleigh Binar convection, we have two. We have a Prandtl number and we have uh, a dry or a Rayleigh number, which is given here. And <coughs> since we have two fields, we have two Rayleigh numbers now. And we have two more parameters which are hidden in the saturation uh, in the saturation condition, and they basically prescribe the water content that we are sustaining at the bottom boundary and at the top boundary. If this parameter is zero, it means that the bottom uh, boundary is held right at the saturation threshold, and in Bretherton's model, basically this state was sustained across the whole layer. So in his case, CWH would also be exactly zero. What we will actually uh, do and what we did extensively is we have played with these parameters and as I will show you in a minute, this drives the system in different states of convection which are closer to the classical convection case or qualitatively completely different to them. So, <coughs> following the classical works, which go back to Kuo and also Bretherton, we are taking very simple boundary conditions. We are taking these isothermal values for the two plates, so we are prescribing D and M. And we are taking free slip boundary conditions for the velocity fields. Um, in a separate study, Thomas has investigated how the physics changes when we are varying the boundary conditions. For instance, interesting for applications would be prescribing fluxes of the buoyancies or switching to no-slip boundary conditions. It's actually not the no-slip to free-slip which does a lot, but it's the flux to the constant amplitude which does quite a bit. And so this whole thing is, we have a simple geometry, periodic boundary conditions. We can solve everything by a pseudospectral method using fast Fourier transformations. Uh, the domain is decomposed into pencils, which allows massively parallel computations. We could run the present problems on up to two racks uh, of the blue gene uh, system, which was, in, uh, which was installed in Germany. In the, in this summer, it was substituted by a new blue gene Q machine, um, which allows even larger computations. So I said already <coughs> that we can drive the system in different regimes. And <coughs> these regimes result from the equilibrium states which we construct with our prescribed amplitudes at the top and at the bottom. And we can prescribe a system which we refer to as the linearly unstable regime uh, in which we basically have two positive Rayleigh numbers, both fields, D and M, are unstably stratified across the layer. And this system behaves very similar 
to the classical convection regime in the sense that the turbulence which arises is space filling. And that's, that's the same issue as in, um, in, in classical dry convection. This is a contour plot of the liquid water content in the mid plane. And you see the patterns are everywhere. The interesting state is the one when we have the conditionally unstable regime. That means the dry air is stably stratified. The moist air is unstably stratified. In our framework, this means we have a negative Rayleigh number for the dry field and a positive one for the moist field. And this system has to be initiated by a finite perturbation, and it behaves very similar to a shear flow. In a shear flow, when a shear flow goes to a transition, it goes via localized patterns. And this is exactly what you see here. Yeah? You see that there's a localized turbulent patch, and there's an ambient environment with a much smaller level of turbulent intensity. If you are playing this game too, too strongly, clearly you reach the uh, absolute stability threshold and then uh, the system is not at all able to switch on uh, convective motion. You need a cape which is positive as we all. Yeah. Are the inequalities the same? Sorry? Uh, well, we can tune the system such. I'm showing actually a, a, an example where we have taken exactly the same Rayleigh numbers. We are just switching the sign of the D so Rayleigh in number. Case, so the REM is greater than zero. Right? This one is greater zero. So uh, which one? Typo, no, 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 no. This is no typo. No. This one so is no, always no. positive. It's just that if you are. No, no, you have two cases. No, 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 that's no typo. No, no, that means if we are just increasing the stable stratification of the dry field more and more and more, then we get no positive case, and then nothing can happen. So, RM is less than something else. Yeah. You should have had a critical. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, Let's take, a look, let's take a closer look to, uh, to this regime now. Let's take a closer look to this regime. And um, now you can basically, you start, to, um, you start to increase the stable stratification of your equilibrium. And, um, and then, you are, and then what, what we have done is very, close, uh, is very similar to what have people done in the last decade uh, to understand the transition to turbulence in shear flows, particularly in pipe flow. Um, they have basically done a statistical analysis. So what you can do, for instance, is you can vary the amplitude of your finite initial perturbation. These are some arbitrary units. And here you can um, change the degree of stable stratification. And um, that means it's, it's uh, more and more stably stratified when you're going from the left to the right. And then you see, uh, when you're doing this in a, in a small-scale model, and you're, each point here is, is really one single DNS run, so these are quite a few of those runs, you see that, the, uh, that basically the basin uh, or the border between the two basins of attraction, namely the sustained convective state and the laminar state, forms a rather complex shape. And uh, you can also do... A similar analysis, a statistical analysis, uh, in the way that you are taking 100 perturbations, at di all distributed on an energy shell in phase space, and you are just uh, uh, applying these perturbations, and you are cal calculating the probability of how many of those 100 guys become a turbulent uh, convection state, and how many um, return back to lamina. And then you are getting, for increasing stable stratification already in this regime, a point at which it is almost impossible um, to sustain uh, a convective turbulence. And this, these kind of states are referred to as, in the, in the pipe flow business, as so-called edge states. So these are really the states that make up the boundary of the basin of attraction for the convection state. 
in the full simulations, we are not able to, to do such a complete analysis, but you see, even if we are doing it uh, for several points, and these are all, uh, in parts, quite heavy DNS runs, um, that indeed you are recovering, again, the same properties as here, convective state, a little bit more uh, dry stratification, laminar state, but then again, convective state, and so they are all run at the same resolutions, same initial conditions, but different parameters here. Yeah, as I said, there are some interesting similarities with um, the classical transition to turbulence in, in shear flows. Uh, one more um, figure to illustrate uh, what we are doing in our system when we are moving from the classical dry convective state to the conditionally unstable regime. So this would be, in a dry convection case, the temperature profile. You have two boundary layers. You have a well-mixed state in the bulk, and you have another boundary layer. The convective heat flux uh, is zero due to the uh, no-slip boundary conditions or to the free-slip boundary conditions. And then it is prob uh, uh, a constant in the bulk. So, and this uh, would mean you have upward transport of heat in such a system. In the linearly unstable regime of moist Rayleigh-Binar convection, be stratified, and the moist, oh sorry, here, this is the red curve, and the moist field is still unstably stratified. So with respect to the moist field, the buoyancy flux is still positive, and with respect to the dry field, we have downward transport or anti-transport, and the resulting real buoyancy flux, the blue line, is hopefully positive such that we are uh, having some cloud formation at all. Two slides on the linearly unstable regime. So these are two characteristic um, snapshots. This is a 3D picture. Uh, all the gray is our clouds, which are illustrated here in yellow. And the red are the upward velocity, the strongest upward velocity motion. This is a rather large convection cell, 4,096 square grid points times 256. And this is one of these heavier computations we have done. <laughs> and you see now um, you are prescribing a water deficit at the top, and then you are getting these um, isolated clouds. If you are decreasing this, um, you are getting more and more connected cloud cover. And if it goes beyond zero, it, I mean it turns, if it turns positive, then you would have a closed cloud layer in the system. We have actually also tried to uh, do a geometric analysis of our um, cloud patterns and have made a comparison with existing results, for instance, by Sibisma and Yonka. And you are recognized for the uh, you are recognized for these cloud uh, boundaries here, similar fractal box counting dimensions in the system. And there's an interesting aspect. Uh, this is all close to four-third, what we find here, which starts in our case, if you are so ambitious and put a power law through this cloud of points, which uh, might be debatable. But uh, nevertheless, we did it. And um, so it starts basically above the Taylor micro scale in our system that the cloud patterns which we see start to uh, develop such a four-third scaling. And there have been discussions uh, on this uh, subject in the, in the context of percolation processes, for instance, by Neelin and others. So, <clears throat> um, I said at the beginning we are doing direct numerical simulations, and here is where we have to pay. As you know, there is no free lunch, and that is also in our case true. Um, so, these are typical values which we have. Uh, this would be a uh, typical situation. So we have a two kilometer high convection cell. We are having, the, uh, we're having an isothermal surface considered as a, in, in, a, in a zeros approximation as the ocean surface. We have something like an inversion, which uh, uh, is probably 
something which one might think of in terms of the upper boundary. And then you can calculate your potential or liquid uh, water potential temperatures and the corresponding equivalent potential temperatures for the given heights and for the given material parameters. You would end up with Rayleigh numbers of the order of 10 to 18, 10 to 19. And um, we see, as you see, um, in our case, the Rayleigh numbers are by at least 12 orders below these realistic values. And uh, okay, anyhow, nevertheless, we think that even for those small Rayleigh numbers, uh, those kind of studies uh, are interesting uh, and we can learn something. So the conditionally unstable regime is uh, illustrated here. Um, as I said <coughs> already in my one slide, and here you see it now from our simulations, uh, what you get for sufficiently large aspect ratios are isolated uh, clouds. These are the cloud boundaries, and as the contour color contour plot below, we see the moist buoyancy, and you see that you have the strong updrafts uh, exactly there where the clouds appear in our system. This is uh, periodic boundary conditions. That's why. Um, so basically, this one is uh, coming together again with uh, the other cloud aggregate on the other side. Uh, well, we prescribe, we are prescribing D and M at the top and at the bottom. And from D and M, from these values, we can calculate the liquid water and the, uh, uh, yeah, the liquid water content. This is held fixed at the top and at the bottom. Uh, yes. It goes very close, yeah, yeah, sure. So let's take a look into such a cloud, uh, into such an aggregate. Um, so this is the cloud boundary, and you see indeed that there is enhanced uh, turbulent activity inside these aggregates. So we have upwelling and downwelling flow, and um, on average, and this is this figure. Uh, Things are always moving upwards inside the cloud. This is the vertical velocity average in regions where clouds exist. And this is the average velocity in the rest of the layer outside the aggregates where we have a, mass, a, a much smaller turbulence level and where on average indeed everything is uh, going downward. So the air rises up inside these aggregates and slowly descends outside. Of this, of what? Well, this is measured across the whole layer. So these profiles are measured across the whole layer. Is there an effect of cloud base, I think? And cloud height, cloud height In this particular, in this particular case, it's the top of the model. Yeah. This is a the the colored is a horizontal cut at the mid, yeah. at yeah, the mid. What in the well, uh, well, the, no, no, the patterns are changing a little bit. Okay. Yes, but on uh, the average picture is this one. Yeah, so this is the average flux upward. Yes. How high does a adiabatic moist parcel have to rise? Or it's the buoyancy to increase by a factor of, of, a factor of what? E. E. 2.7183. Or Yeah. Now, presumably, depending on the ratio of that length to the... Okay. 
All right. Good. Yeah. The, the other question that I would get is that this is obviously no trial is classified environment. Sorry? There is no trial is classified environment. So, so in other words, there is no stratification. Oh, there is stable stratification outside yes, the clouds. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so then, okay, now I'm curious, you know, an observation, because you often see those shells. Of I'm coming to that <laughs> later, yeah, yeah, okay. that's coming. I mean, I'm talking okay. about the Lagrange yeah, stuff. Okay. So these are just the several clouds matched together, and that's why yeah. you don't see Well, this is one big aggregate which has some, uh, a rich, uh, some engulfments and so on. Yes. It's not really. This, a single blue plume you get when you have very small really numbers. So this is already. Okay, I have some other questions. Sure. Let you go yeah. Yeah. Um, so now we have what we have done now is we have basically done some systematic studies. We have increased the aspect ratio and we have increased the Rayleigh number as much as we could, and. What you see from this picture is that when you're going up in the Rayleigh number and you are proportionally to the moist Rayleigh number also increasing the stable stratification. So the ratio is kept fixed between RD and RM, RAM. So that means it's becoming more and more difficult for the system to, to, to initiate such a, such a state. And the reason is there is less and less diffusion outside which is able to, con to, to close the convective loop. The stuff wants to rise up, but the diffusion outside the cloud is so small, it's becoming smaller and smaller when we are going up in Rayleigh, that the loop cannot be closed, or it's more and more inefficient to transport the fluid back by a, by a descent. So that means this system, as I have discussed it right now, runs into a pathological limit. Yeah? Okay. So yeah, what do we have to do? Not yeah. Well, uh, well, we are thinking, think just in terms of the convection. Think just in terms that the stuff is going up here. And, and this is the old Bjergnes picture. It has to go somewhere down here. Yeah? So, but it can go down here only by diffusion. There is nothing else. It's stably stratified. So here you need radiative cooling because these clouds are trying to be deep convective clouds and you're forcing them to be shallow clouds. Yes. And that's what we're doing. But uh, let me first so tell... So our clouds <laughs> are the other regime, deep to congestive. Yeah. <laughs> so let me first show you that it is indeed a very bad transporter of heat, which we, which we see here. Um, so this is the um, um, so this is a threshold uh, which we suggested for our transport, and these are actually the real Nusselt numbers which we have measured in the system. And here's unity. So this would mean purely diffusive transport. So you are barely above the diffusive transport if you are considering the system as a whole. And now I'm coming to the one question which you asked. Now I'm, now I'm switching the dry field from stably stratified to unstably stratified and keeping the Rayleigh number exactly the same. It flips the point above the threshold and gives me an order of magnitude higher heat transport. It's still a rather small Rayleigh number, but this is exactly the issue. And uh, so, so we are having a problem here. And uh, as Andy already said, we have to do something. We have to... Uh, introduce some kind of radiative process and what we are doing is we are introducing um, a very simple bulk cooling scheme in our system and since the dry and the moist adiabatic lapse rates are um, different as we know we are also sho shooting the cooling rates which are basically the prefactors uh, before this uh, vertical profile have different uh, amplitude. And this, this driving, for simplicity, we are keeping this even fixed. So this is, has not, not much to do with the realistic cooling effect which you think of go, is goes from the cloud. But in this system, it introduces uh, a new mechanism which drives the parcels away from this mixing line, from this complete 
synchronization between D and N. And already a first glance shows you that the stuff really goes on, and this is the, the little spark uh, on the barrel which brings the yeah kind of explosion in the system. And this is the cloud cover again, upwelling, so downwelling. Uh, yeah, it's, we are remaining in exactly the same setting. So this is the upward, downward moving velocity, and you see that much more activity is immediately going on. And um, a yes. We just have uh, the dry, the dry and the moist rate. Yeah, yeah, we have fixed this to, uh, in Rather principle, you. Have, you could have a, a correction with damping, Newton, Newton damping or something. Whatever, yeah, sure, yeah. But we, we, our intention is really to keep things as simple as possible and to... Um, but I, I would have thought a correction with Newton damping and not having these mean changes would be better. Yeah. It would be, it would be uh, on top. So if you are looking at the, at the mean profiles now, um, the blue ones are the cases without radiation. And you see that the dry field without radiation is stably stratified. These are exactly the same profiles which I have shown before. This one is unstably stratified. And now you are increasing the cooling by turning up this parameter. And um, you see that um, there are these changes in the M field. And the more interesting part is that you are basically destabilizing the dry field as well through this cooling. So what you are basically uh, achieving is that you are uh, forming a convection, a dry convection sublayer. The picture which we have in mind is something like that. So this is the classical uh, case without cooling. We have the moist plume, and then it has to, it, uh, the dry air descends, and here everything is stably stratified. And um, now you're switching on the cooling, and then you're basically um, evolving substructures in the dry convection layer, which additionally amplify the whole transport and turbulence in the layer. The cloud cover goes up, as you see here, uh, when you are increasing the cooling rate, and uh, in this case, almost up to full cloud cover. So as I said before, why is this the case? Well, we are introducing a new time scale in the system, which is related to the cooling rate. That if you, so basically, all these processes become completely irrelevant, and the whole convective stuff is done between these two time scales, because this one is just too large yeah, and too inefficient. So coming to this, um, to this destabilization mechanism here, what we have done now is we have taken our slab and we have divided it into, slab, into pencils. And then we have basically determined a local boundary layer thickness uh, from the dry uh, buoyancy profile in each of those slabs. And then you can basically define by, by taking, so we are defining a new Rayleigh number by taking the gradient, taking this thickness to the power of four, we can define a new local uh, boundary layer thickness. And this is done uh, in subcells or in pencils, IJ, which fill the whole cell. And then you can study the distribution of these Rayleigh numbers. And you see that without cooling, you have stable stratification. All of these local Rayleigh numbers are uh, negative. And then you're switching on. Uh, you have not really an effect, but you see that things are piling up. And then you get positive ones with, increasing, with increased cooling. And this dashed line 
would be something like a critical Rayleigh number in our system, which is the, uh, for the free slip case, the 27 over 4 pi to the power of 4. So here, once more, the procedure, we are determining this boundary layer thickness by just taking uh, the cross-section of uh, this line and the slope, which is going out from the profile at this point. So, and indeed, also the, the Nusselt number, which we are formulating here in terms of the liquid water, which is transported across the layer, increases again exactly what we wanted to have. We reamplify the turbulence when we are increasing the cooling rate. So the next is <coughs> that we have taken a Lagrangian analysis uh, in this system. So we are seeding a bunch of tracers in the dry environment, and we are seeding a bunch of tracers at the bottom of the moist uh, structure in both cases. And this is how this spread of tracers, a few hundred thousand in each case, spreads as the time passes by. So you see you have a very nice mixing uh, in this system, and uh, you have almost no mixing in this system. You see also that if you're seeding them in this regime, uh, there's not a lot of spreading, but much more spreading if, you, uh, <coughs> if you're seeding them outside of the aggregate. And what these tracers actually are doing, uh, this is a view from the side. So um, here you see this uh, stably stratified set. So there's no, almost no vertical diffusion simply since the Rayleigh number is so large. And here, much more happens, as you can see, when we are switching on the bulk cooling. So, um, and now I'm coming back to Wojtek's question. Um, these tracers, indeed, what they are doing is, indeed, they are uh, going up inside the cloud, and they are going basically downward right next to the cloud boundaries. This picture is here a little bit smeared out because uh, that is now um, a snapshot which was taken at later time. But in principle, they are doing this. They are actually not doing this, that they are going this way and then going down here. They are going immediately down yeah, right yeah, next yeah, to the... Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the subsiding shell paper, Hoyce yeah, and Yonkers. Yeah. And this is here actually an original cumulus cloud measurement from Holger Siebert uh, from the Kariba campaign. You see nicely the cloud edge. You see the downdrafts at outside of the cloud, and at least to some degree, we are reproducing these features in our simulations as well. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have done, we have done a few more things. Oh, I'm, yeah, I have to rush. So we have measured accelerations, but that is probably something which is not so interesting. Um, so I'm switching to the next. Uh, and that the last part is uh, we, we try to reduce the degrees of freedom systematically. The reason is um, to come up with some low dimensional models. And what we have chosen is a classical method, um, which is the POD analysis. and um, so what we, had, we have taken these uh, DNS and we have basically uh, reconstructed the POD modes and we are comparing them with our, um, with our DNS data. And um, yeah, the agreement is not too bad, at least uh, for the degrees of reduction which we have tried. Here are two snapshots that compare everything. And um, yeah, that's basically... That's basically it. Um, so we have discussed already all these issues. And I just want to say a few words for the outlook. We are now thinking of a Lagrangian analysis of entrainment and detrainment. And in terms of the low-dimensional model, which I unfortunately couldn't talk too much about, we are also thinking seriously about alternatives to the POD. And um, there's currently another. Uh, interesting uh, plan going on and taking slowly shape. Um, we are running uh, beside the barrel 
a high pressure convection facility which is uh, using SF6. As you might know, SF6 is a gas which is six times heavier than air. So you can run uh, the convection at a, a ten times sm uh, smaller, in a ten times smaller system at the same Prandtl and Rayleigh number when you're increasing the pressure. And uh, in, this case, in this sense, you can do a downscaling and you, can, you have really the chance to study the large-scale structure formation in convection in dry, certainly, probably also in moist. We're just thinking of this because the phase boundary is not too far from minus 40, 30 Celsius, something which can be done. So <coughs> the idea is really to have a, a nice controlled laboratory experiment in which you can better understand the, the formation of large-scale structures in convective systems. Okay, with the references and the thanks to the funding agencies, I'm, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, if there is a lateral entrainment, how the uh, how the downdrafts will get strengthened in the boundaries edges? If the, if there is a yeah, we have. Uh, I have to say, we are just now starting to do the study the entrainment in this system. Yeah. So, but the hope is what because we are doing the Lagrangian analysis. The hope is that we are really. Uh, and we are monitoring uh, basically the properties along the air parcels that we are really uh, learn something about entrainment and detrainment in these aggregates. I hope to tell you more next time. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I would like to know what are the what is the origin of those uh, downdrafts, strong downdrafts you have seen at the center of the cloud. Do they yeah. originate uh, from the cloud top or? Uh, well, this are, is probably they... just because there's some convective turbulence going on. There are multiple blooms because a single plume be, uh, with a higher Rayleigh number becomes fragmented into substructures. Uh, so is on it average, the micro... it's going up. Yeah, but uh, if you're taking a closer look, you have. Uh, is it uh, microphysically? Is it a result? No. Not in no. this model. Not in this model. <laughs> It has something has no. to come down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I was. Uh, These downdrafts of the eddies yeah. about the height. We have multiple discussions going on. <laughs> it's a yeah. Let's discuss it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We need to move. Yeah.